العالم والسلاك والسلام والشكل المرسلين والعالم والسحب الجمعين I'm going to introduce myself. I think I know a lot of you here in the community. My name is Leila Shabara and I'm uh, an educator and I've been involved in Islamic education for about 15 years and education in general for about 25. I've been working with the leadership in this masjid for, the, for um, a, over a year and you should be very proud and feel honored that the leadership in this masjid really wants to expand the services they provide to the community. So they've asked experts to come on board and see what else we can do to improve on the quality of the services we provide as far as education for all ages, starting with preschool, elementary, high school, our youth programs. So this is part of probably, we're hoping, a series. So tonight we have a special speaker who's come from Tampa. Um, Sheikh Hassan Sultan, who's also been involved in Islamic education for decades. He's going to speak a little bit about his experience and expertise and share some wisdom with you. And then we'd really like to hear from you, the parents, the children, the youth, about what you want from your community, what you want from your Islamic center, what would you would like to see if there is a school here, if you want a school, what kind of school, what kind of programs. So. Um, Sheikh Hassan is a product of Islamic schools. He graduated from Islamic school as an 11th grader, went on to college and earned his degree in business, right? Yes. And he, he is also a founder of the Muslim Connection, which is a, youth, uh, which is a community organization. He's um, very heavily involved in Islamic education on many avenues, and I'll have him talk a little bit more about that. And please, um, after his um, little talk, we are going to ask you to share with, with us some ideas and later on actually give you a survey to write down what it is that you want from the community. So please kind of remain inside until we're done for the evening. Thank you. Sheikh Hassan. And 
they've been friends for a very, very long time. And they always consult whether about fatwas and so forth. And the reason I mention this, subhanAllah, is that in my upbringing as a young Muslim in this country, I've been involved in you know, a lot of youth activities, I've been involved in a lot of things, and my, I myself have done trips, tournaments, and so forth. And when you look at the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad and the example, you see that when he addressed the people, he addressed their minds, and he addressed their hearts and their souls. And why do I say that? Because a lot of times when you want to bring people to the masjid, we would say, well, or even young people will say we want to bring pizza, or we want to bring food, or we want to do this or that. I want us to go beyond that. All right, go beyond the artificial surface and be able to address the minds of the listener and realize this is something beyond their desire we're trying to address. Because what happens is, um, I'll give an example. I, once I drove uh, a lot of the high school kids, we went to Detroit for a Miss Tournament, Muslim, Muslim Scholastic Tournament. And I, I did a lot of these things for the high school. So I realized when they graduated, uh, these students, they appreciated you as me as a person. Right? Or they appreciate the fact they had fun on these trips. But one thing I realized later on that th there was a, a connect made between that and Islam. So they'll go to college, right, and they're on their own. And the last time they'll open a mushaf or go to a halaqa, a lot of times it's when they're in high school. And ask yourself why, because, because the thing is the connection wasn't made between the trips and the activities. It was more of those things were fun, right? But now, the moment they leave these institutions, they're on their own and they're, they live completely different lives. And uh, I remember when I was in this month of Ramadan, I, was, I went to somebody's house, my mom called me. And there was an 18 year old boy and he was eating in front of me, right? I was like, okay. And I remember this kid used to come to like these Halakos Fridays. And I said to him, he thought his, you know, he didn't respect his mom. And so I said, what are you doing in your life? He said, I'm going to college to do uh, study drones. So I said, you're going to be killing us soon, inshallah, right? And like, he's going to study this and he's going to go there. And he said, he has, and I asked him, his, mom, his mom's main concern is that he has to pray and all these other things that the culture requires. I said to him, do you even truly believe in God? He's like, no, I have doubts. Uh, this guy has, has major issues, right? So the, the, while the parents focus on the artificial stuff, or what the people will say, I don't care about that, right? Because the scholars say reputation is not something you can control. That's out of your hand, right? The one thing we do control is our character. And that's the one thing we'll be asked about on the Day of Judgment, is how we conduct ourselves. So anyways, as I'm speaking to him, I realize with him and many others, all right, that back then, the older generation, when it came to marriage and it came to deen, it's like no matter what happens, no divorce, all right, because it's against the culture. And we don't question anything about religion because, not because Islam is the way we, we want to follow, but it's like we don't, want, we don't want to challenge that because we're not supposed to ask. So you'll never see somebody, for example, in the Middle East, open a gas station, sell alcohol in the village. You'll, 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 the aunts and the uncles will kick them out. Right? You won't accept that. Right? But the moment we step land foot in America, things all of a sudden change. All right? And that's why, because the, the connection wasn't Islam, it was culture. All right? Now, the new generation, divorce now, I mean, I personally dealt with over 30 cases this year, subhanAllah. All right? People have no patience no more. Nobody wants a level of commitment. And it's the same thing with Islam. Last week, I gave a talk at USF, University of South Florida. The kids were asking, is hell just? Why, why do we even go to hellfire? Why do we even live in this world? What's the point? Why did God create us? They're asking all these questions, right? So the, the, sheikh, the sheikh, when they went to one of the sheikh, the sheikh said, this is all from shaitan. They said, okay, we're gonna go to the professor. The professor said, you're smart kids. You know, and he, he actually fed them and said, you guys are enlightened thinkers, all right? I'd like to think otherwise, but that's a different story, all right? And in the topic, we broke down the whole idea, is hell just, right? We talked about the conditions and so forth, and afterwards there was a dialogue, right? And the reason I mentioned that is that everyone here should feel that if you have any question about anything that has to do with Deen or life in general, you should feel comfortable talking to Sister Layla. You should feel comfortable talking to Shaykh Hassan Sabri. 
you should be comfortable to address these issues. And on the other hand, we should be willing to understand why the kids are asking these questions. So when the Prophet ﷺ is in Mecca, and a young man addresses him and asks him, can you do something with the opposite gender? Imagine, this is the Prophet. Imagine if you told us, parents, we're going to send you home, we're going to marry your cousins. Right? Don't, why, how, how dare you think of such a thing? Right? The Prophet ﷺ, was very, you know, he understood the young man. He said, would you like this for your mother or your, your sister? He made the young man answer the question. He didn't say you're a haram and how dare you and so forth. He realized that in this life we have temptations. And there's two big challenges we have. We must understand. Number one is shahawat. And number two is shubahat. Number one is desires. The other thing is doubts. Now if I was to ask you which one is more dangerous, I would say the second one. It's shubahat, the doubts. Because desires, all of us challenged with desires every day. The desire to wake up for fajr. The desire, you know, not to look this way or lower our gaze. The desire not to backbite, not to gossip, not to curse, not to listen. It's always a, not, it's a lifelong process, right? Anyone here know Sheikh uh, Drake? Anyone know Drake? Raise your hand. No, no one's going to raise their hand right now, right? He, he under, they, they understand this, right? They want to, so when they, when they come up with something, whether it's a kiki challenge, or like for a ball, a certain way like this, right? Everyone goes, oh my gosh. Right? Everyone's fascinated. All right? Let's open the bottle, drink it, Yanni. Okay? And you people, or whether it's that challenge, or they get people to throw ice on themselves. All right? And they send this apart. So I'm like, they have, they have these things planned out. They're like, we can get kids, and even adults, to do so. And I remember when I was in UIF, I was in ninth grade. I don't know why we had this class. It was called Interpersonal Communication. We only had it for one year, and they canceled it. So our teacher told us, anyone here know Michael Jordan? All right, anyone? All right. Uh, he said if Michael Jordan was to eat bird poop, everyone would start eating bird poop. All right, I was like, we were like, that's impossible. All right, but if you think about it, all right, they have made these people at, a, at such a status that to the point where people will buy their shoes, all right, people will buy their jerseys, buy these things, invest money. You know, I have, we have people can't afford to pay rent, but they'll tell their parents to pay $400 for, for whatever, right? And you ask yourself, what is, what is it that, what is it, what is it this, they connect? And that is, that's why when we have no foundation in Islam, in Islam, this is a bunch of do's and don'ts. And you don't adjust the mind, then you're easily swayed. That's why when uh, Rustam, who is the king of Persia, and there was Sa'd ibn Waqqas, one of the companions sent Rabi ibn Amr to address him. And he went to him and, you know, he, he didn't have much clothes, he wasn't that rich. And uh, Rustam uh, had a red carpet. Kind of like Hollywood, right? They corrupt the world and they give themselves awards after that. Like they award themselves for corrupting the, the world, subhanAllah. And they do the, all these different hashtags. So anyways, when, when, when uh, Rabi Ibn Amr came, he messed up the carpet. He, he wasn't impressed. So Rustam got very angry. Like the king was like, how dare you? So he said, what is it that you're here to say? So he said, well, something, and imagine you're in a class, you have 30 seconds to talk about Islam. You're on a, you're doing a video on Instagram. You're doing a video, Snapchat is going up silly, I think, right now. All right, everybody's going back to Instagram. All right, very few here people go to Facebook and other things. But anyways, all right, imagine you had 30 seconds to address a crowd about Islam. You're in your class. I remember after 9-11, I was a freshman at USF. And in my class, in the history class, I remember they were, they were attacking the seven Muslims. So I, had, I was 17 years old, I had to stand up, and I realized I could stay easily silent. But now you have to address issues, but you have to address it with intelligence and not emotion. You know, when, and that's why I disagree with all these protests that people do for Palestine and all these flags. And I ask people, do you know what the flag stands for? Do you know who made the flag? Do you know what the colors represent the flag? Because if you did, you wouldn't even do it, dare hold the flag. Because it's not Palestine, for example, is not a nationalistic issue. It's not a Palestinian issue. It's an issue of the Ummah. And we have to realize we're an Ummah. When we're here, we're one body. We're not, we're not bound by these borders that they put between us to divide us. Alright? So when somebody asks you, give me five reasons why Islam and Palestine is an important issue for Muslims, we should be able to answer that. But don't get all these slogans, free, free, all this. We don't need to be emotional anymore. We need to be using our mind. We need to be able to write and articulate our ideas and say it in such a way where we can present ourselves without getting angry. Because what happens when you get angry and you get emotional only lasts for a day. 
And then afterwards, the next day you go back. Because the same thing is still happening. The Muslims there are still suffering. It's just not in the media. They, they, when they want us to care about it, they'll put it in the media again. We'll care about it for a few days and then it's gone again. So we can't be controlled by what we, how they want us to do things and when they want us to do it. So then, going back to the story. So when he went to the king, he said, Inna Allah ta'athana لِنُخْرَجَ عِبَادْ مِنْ عِبَادِتِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادِتِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ He said, Allah sent us. Now notice here, this young, I mean this poor Muslim, didn't say Allah sent the Prophet. Right? He didn't say Allah sent the Sahaba. He said Allah sent us. He felt empowered. He felt a part of the Ummah. Every one of you here should feel the same way. That Allah sent me to represent the Prophet ﷺ. Allah sent me to represent Islam. Not the Shaykh. We're all a body. We all represent Islam. You are the only Islam people will see. I, I remember I, I, one of the things I was, I was an athletic director for eight years. So I used to have 12 coaches on there. I, and we had around 150 games. So we had a girls basketball team. So we, uh, one of the things I do, I had to do that day, I was out driving the, the bus. So the girls that were playing there, I had to pray Salat al Maghrib. They were in middle school. So they all went to pray, so some people on the other team, who are they? And what are they? I'm like, they're from Tampa, right? And from here. And what are they doing? Are they Christian? I'm like, no, they're Muslim. And what is it they're doing? I'm saying, they're praying, all right? And they were so shocked. She's like, this is the first time in my life I ever seen a Muslim. And I remember that same year, in 2014, we were playing a Christian school team. And the athletic director said, I never imagined us playing Muslims and Christians in the same, same gym. And then the, the referee for that game did a report. You know, they had something called the Florida High School Athletic Association. And he did a report, he said that he, hoped, he wished world leaders would be like these young Muslims and, and the other team that were, you know, the other school that was a Christian school would act like these young Muslim people and young kids or adults that they would exemplify this, how they played together and they had sportsmanship they played hard and so forth right? they felt, that, and these girls when they prayed Bakhla and SubhanAllah because I taught some of them Islamic studies so it's one thing to sit in a 45 minute class and talk about Islam, but it's just a bunch of information right? if I talk to you about Hajj for all this, is Hajj is just going to be, what is this, Mina, Muzdarifa, right? And I remember when I was a kid, we used to have a tournament called Mina Muslim Youth of North America. So I used to think Mina was a tournament, right? The thing is, until you experience certain things of Islam, it's just something in your mind. It's just a theory. If you just talk about Salah, it's only something in your mind. But it's what makes Islam beautiful is that you get to live it every single day. So when they actually got to practice the Islamic study lesson in front of all these people, they felt so empowered. They're like, wow. Because that's the only Islam all those people will see. All that stuff they said in the news, it was gone in, five, it was gone in a matter of moments. By simply these young Muslim girls praying in public, being proud of who they are, standing up for their identity, and representing their faith. So, this one, so that's why when I talk with this companion, he said, Allah sent us. You gotta feel the sense of empowerment. That you belong to something so great. That you don't, you don't need to get followers to be important. You don't need to look a certain way. You don't need to fake you have a six pack as a guy and take a picture in the mirror, right? And look and, tell, and pretend you're a tough guy, right? And then you need to tell people, look, I'm working out. Nobody cares, all right? Or you have to put all this makeup on and do all these filters, cat filters, dog filters, whatever filter, so people can look here. You, when you feel empowered, you don't need any of that, right? I remember when I was doing that, I was performing a marriage, and I said, you know, look at Nuh alayhi salam. He had only 80 followers for like 950 years. I said, if anyone has 80 followers on Instagram, they'll go be so sad. They'll buy followers. I remember the kids like, he got mad, one of my students got upset. I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, he didn't follow me back. All right, my students, they made a fan page for some reason, right? Has a small fan page. All right. And they got very upset. I was like, I was like, and then some kids buy followers. I'm like, what's wrong with you guys? All right, we got to buy followers nowadays. All right, I said, the most important like is that Allah likes what you do. That Allah approves of what you do. Who cares what anyone else thinks? And then the second thing that he said is very important. To free people from being slaves to other humans, to being slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now think about that. Ibn Qayyim, one of the scholars said that we have to free your, in order to function properly as a Muslim, you have to be free from what others think and how others want you to act. So whether it's by, you know, if you change your name from Muhammad to Mawa, Ali to Al, so you can please others, there's a problem, you're not free. Right? And I'll give you an example. The Shaykh was saying 
or one of the brothers I know, he, he was given an example of a, of a sister at his job that was wearing high heels, all right? So he asked her, why are you wearing high heels, all right? He's like, she's like, you know what, because when she went to the mall, she had a choice between flat and high heels. And he said, I guarantee you, you didn't buy it because it's comfortable, all right? It's like foot terrorism, he said, all right? Imagine you get blisters, it's painful, like, you know, it's very hard. Why, why did you get high heels? And she said at the end of the discussion, she said because people said it looks good. So some guy who manufactured those shoes put it in the news or the media in a commercial that if you wear this type of shoe, you're going to look good. And he got people to convince him. Another person said, you know what, I'm going to bring jeans, cut holes in them, and see if people wear it. And people wear it. And people like, this is the fashion, right? They test us. So we have to ask ourselves, are we consumers? Where everything we see, we, we do, without realizing, whether it's the phones, whether it's this or that. That's why people see things on WhatsApp, people share right away. Most of the stuff on WhatsApp is fake, right? It's not true. But we just, we're so in a rush to share something, to follow something, all right? We just got to take a step back and realize we got to first free ourselves from being a slave to the ideas and thoughts of others, all right? And how others want us to be and be slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be true slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And realize that that step and that big step in life, all right, whether your parents are there or not, would be not, it's not important. Because you don't follow Islam because your parents. All right? You don't follow Islam because what people will say. You follow Islam because you're, you're, a, you're a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now when it comes to Islamic institutions and education, and I don't, I don't know, Sister Layla, how much time I have left. All right? You want to stop, go? I don't know. Keep, keep going. Uh, keep going? Alright, so anyways, uh, so, so I remember, um, so with that being said, so I remember when, when they first established schools in Tampa, and around the U.S., and I've been, I, I went to some other Islamic schools in the, in the country, and I like to call them Muslim public schools, right, because the word the Islam, you know, calls a heavy meaning, and the reality of the matter is, I remember I, I was teaching some girl, I asked, I asked the girls, I said, if you guys had the choice, how many of you would take off your hijab? All of them, like, raised their hand. Except for like one girl, right? I said, most of you, after 3 or 5, everyone takes it off, right? And when they leave school, most of them don't wear it. And the reason I mention this is because when hijab becomes a cultural thing, when Islam becomes a cultural thing, there's no connection to Allah, then they become a slave to what their parents think. See, the, the, the slave you here is that even though your parents are obedient, right? And their parents become ATM machines. The moment you make your own money, you don't need your parents. So that's why I tell kids, your parents can be the poorest people on earth. You don't respect your parents because they bought you something. You don't respect your parents. And that's why parents have a problem also. You don't, your kids shouldn't have to respect you because you buy them things as a father. That's not what makes a relationship successful when you buy even your spouse things. That's not, people live in the nicest of houses, drive the nicest of cars, and have miserable lives. But they'll put a photo online to make everyone think, look at our life, the perfect family. And it's the most corrupt family. They can't even talk to each other for five minutes. All right? And that's the reality. We have, to, we have to really talk about reality. We have to stop putting a fake image in front of people. We have issues. We have concerns. We have doubts. We have, it's hard. All right? We were always so busy trying to impress others and have this image in front of others. Be true to yourself. All right? So then when, when so it's not about buying things. And that's why I said in the Hutba today, I didn't elaborate much about it. I personally, you know, think about it. You know, when I was younger, we had to like, you know, we did, you know, my dad worked as an imam for 30 years before he passed away. And I remember, you know, you know back then it was like, you know, you know, when you do this, even though he had his PhD in education, right, he had all these other opportunities, he chose to take this path, right, and take this path, you know, it's a sacrifice you make. But I realized, you know, I went horseback riding, I played in tournaments, I did sleepovers, did all these things. It didn't make me who I am today. All those things were nice. What made me who I am today, all right? And I'm not saying I'm somebody great, but at least appreciate Islam and understood what Islam meant. And realize that, you know what, some days I'll have off days. Some days I'll do things I'm not supposed to do. But I know for sure, I'll never blame Islam. I know for sure Islam is the way. So when I think about hell, right, and I think about, the, you know, for example, if somebody wants to ask me this quick example, right, the scholars say, you know, you look at the action, not the action itself, but the value of the intention of the action. So a quick example of that, all right? If a doctor cuts up a body, all right, with a knife, 
the doctor gets rewarded. One action, but if somebody else does, does the same action the doctor does, but is on the street and is harming someone, it gets a bad deed, right? It's a crime. Now the thing is, I remember anyone here ever watched Cops, Bad Boys, Bad Boys? Anyone? Back in the day, I think it's old school, anyways. All right. And uh, what happened was, I remember one of the shows, they, that somebody did something to a cop, right? And their life sentence was not like, you know, if you kill like Muslims now, you get rewarded. You got you called uh, a freedom fighter, right? Nowadays, if you, if you attack certain people, you're called a hero. But if you attack anyone here, right, the white guy, you're like, uh, you're going like straight to Jahannam here, right? You're, it's, it's the worst thing. So even when it comes to that, what do they do? They sentence you, they sent this person to 250 years in prison, right? Three life sentences. Even though the other person is not going to, they said that because the person they committed the crime against is just out of status, that he that when he when he do when he talk back to a cop, right? Not even your parents. If you talk back to your parents here, right? Like this is what Simpsons and the Family Guy teach you, right? Talk back to your parents. The dog is smarter than your dad, right? Subhanallah. Right? And that's, that's a whole different discussion in itself. Nothing happens. But you talk back to authority, you're going to jail. You can get shot nowadays. That's for simply talking back. All right? Imagine that. Now imagine all right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, imagine when we commit a crime against Allah. I said, look, I don't expect this to be perfect. But when you accuse Allah all right, of having a partner, now imagine I worked in a company and I told my boss, you're not my boss. And I'm the best employer. Would I get fired? Yes or no? All right. I told him, hey, you're not my boss. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even approve of you. All right. He's like, who the heck are you? All right. See your way out. All right. As people say, you'd be shook. All right. So, so you, you, you no matter how good you are, because people say these arguments. Well, he was a good person. All right. But then we ask ourselves this question: What determines what is good and what is bad? We have to always ask ourselves: Who is the determining factor? Because what's good to you is bad to him. And what's good for her is bad for her. Why? Because every one of us has a different opinion about what's good. So then there's this thing called liberalism. That's such a strong thing that's affecting everyone in this country, even Muslims. That they say you're the best decider of how you live your life. You should know what's best for you. Nobody should tell you what to do. You know, they say, YOLO, you only live once, right? Alright, do whatever you want. You know, enjoy life. Who, to, why do people tell you, like, me to? Come home at 9 o'clock, you're 15 years old. Your mom tells you come home at 9? Come on. I got some hair on my face, right? I'm an adult, right? I know how to drive a car and I know how to turn on the radio and listen to music and everyone knows that. That makes me an adult now, right? And I can almost carry something in the gym. You know, my parents should respect me, man. Right? I, know, I know how to live life, right? And even though I have no responsibility, but that's what they tell you. That's what the society tells you. That you should express yourself. Say whatever you think and everyone becomes a sheikh on social media. All right, everyone celebrates when somebody dis, you know, disobeys Allah. It becomes a, it becomes a celebration. All right? And the reason, again, goes back to the fundamental point. When you look at Bilal al-Anhu, who's the companion, and he's, he just is being tortured in the desert, and they're putting a rock on top of his stomach, and they're saying to him, say there's no God, like, dis, you know, disobey Allah by, by you know, negating the shahada. And he, all he says is, Ahad Ahad, one God, one God. And again, they torture him. So later on, in, in Umar al-Khattab would ask uh, Bilal al anhu may Allah please with them all, he said, why is it that the only thing you said was one God, one God? Like, I, and what, what did Bilal say? He said, had I known anything else, I would have said it. Had I known anything else, I would have said it. So imagine that all he had to know was two words, or one word actually. Ahadun ahad, one God, one God. And that was enough for him at that moment to really give up everything. But we look at Musab ibn Umair, another young companion, around your age, never wore the same clothes twice. He found out about Islam, he gave up all of them. He, you know, and to, to bring an example in recent, because you always talk about the Sahaba. Anyone here know who Tupac Shakur is? All right, he's not a Sahabi, by the way. All right. He had a rapper named Napoleon. And we, and we had a basketball tournament in Orlando, and Napoleon was a guest speaker. And I remember we had to be there by 9.30, so we had to drive up, we had to leave, leave from 8 o'clock, so either way, we either get forfeited for the game. So I'm going, we're going to, to listen to this guy, and he, he became Muslim. Alright? 
So he's saying, before Islam, when he used to rap and do whatever, he used to have whatever he wanted, whatever car he wanted, whatever. Like, you know, what's the point of life? To eat, go to college, get a piece of paper, right? Be in debt if you go to medical school, $300,000, right? Pay up, spend a whole life of owing people and being a slave, of just paying, paying money, a mortgage, right? Because, you know, if you live in an apartment, oh my gosh, everyone's going to say you live in an apartment in 2018. Who cares, right? Stop being a slave to what people think. Stop making, going in debt when we have a big wedding and spend $70,000 instead of investing in each other as a husband and a wife and preparing the future, and paving the way, and investing in a school, investing in Salt Lake Jaya. But we just, we, we're such a slave in everything, whether it's our weddings, whether it's the cars we do, whether it's the posts we make, all that stuff. We have to free ourselves from what other people think. Because on the Day of Judgment, Allah describes to us a scene in Surah Al-Baqarah, right? That those people that used to listen to, and used to, like that uncle that told you if you do a wedding, mix, and if you don't do a mix, I'm not coming. Or that person, uh, Drake, all these people, they'll say, you know, and may Allah guide them. Alright, I'll say, I mean. Alright. Is that they'll say, I never told anyone to listen to my stuff. He's like, I have nothing to do with these people. They will disassociate themselves from you completely. So then when, when you try to say, oh Allah, give me another chance. I want, I want to disassociate myself from them. Allah says, it's too late. You may, it may at that point, it's too late. So now what I'm saying today, when we, when we free yourself from the temptation of this world, and that's when Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ The Prophet ﷺ was not said, but as a mercy to humanity. A lot of people, they talk about mercy, they talk about all he, you know, fed the homeless, and so, which is somewhat true. But what actually the ultimate mercy is Islam. We have to look at Islam as the ultimate mercy. And I'll say this example, anyone here attend the khutbah today, raise your hand. Alright? So some of you weren't here, so I'll say the story again. Or the name, you know, the name I, I described the name of Allah al wadud the excessively loving, all right? And you know, Subhanallah, I was saying how the Prophet describes the love of Allah is more than the mercy of a, a love of a mother towards her child. And I was blessed with my fourth child a, a couple of months ago, and you see that mercy, Subhanallah. It's, like, it's not something you hear about; you live it. And none of you, as young Muslims, will understand the ayat and ahadith about parents till you have your own child. Right? You'll never understand it, right? You can hear all day about respecting parents, but you'll never appreciate it until you hold that baby in your arms. You realize, whoa, right? I gotta change diapers now, right? You know, because we live in a time where everything's done for you. You know, the parents make sure you got your cars, they give you everything. The parent dads will tell you how you used to walk 10 miles to go to school. Now you, you can do whatever, right? You get everything I did. So now, like iPhone, iTouch, iPad, i this, it's all about i, 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 right? It's all about you. Right? Not T.I. of course. Okay? Now, and even fast food. We don't want even to be patient. People wanna, don't even want to work out. Like they want everything. Even in schools, right, people cheat like never before. Nobody wants to even study anymore. You know, in USF, they call that, there's, some, there's a term called zones. Right? These kids, college kids, and biochem, and they use this term called zones. They like, they all like, you know, have these exams and so forth. But going back to the point, right, is that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 100 branches of mercy. And one, only one of those branches is for this earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing how much He loves us. I remember when I went to USF, and I always have these Christians. And one of them, he came, he came to my khutbah a couple weeks ago when I gave it at the university. And he's like, do you know God loves you? I'm like, of course I don't. Alright? And uh, he said to me, he's like, you know, he, he, it was not really a compliment. He's like, you know, you're the best Muslim I know. And I know where he was going, right? But he's like, do you even know you're going to heaven? Because somebody died for my sins and I'm going to heaven, right? I was like, oh, if that was that easy, right? So if I just kill you right now, somebody will die for my sin? I don't even have to go to jail. Why should I even go to jail? What is this theory of yours that this God, you claim to be God, is bound by the limits we're bound by, right? So anyway, we had a respectful discussion, whatever. But one thing is, when you understand the word love, right? And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us and how He sent us a mercy for us, you will understand, and I give this example today, that if any of you, as parents, saw your child running towards a fire, and that child is three years old, and you went and got up and got the child away from the fire, right? Anyone would do that. If you don't, you're, you guys are crazy. You need to talk to me afterwards, right? If you saw, you don't, you don't stop your that child neglect, of course, right? Now that young child doesn't say thank you, mom. He says, mom, you're so mean. You don't let me have fun, because the child doesn't know the harm of the fire, right? So they think their parents are preventing them from having fun. Right? Because they don't understand how dangerous that fire is. Even touching it, being near it, can put that kid's life in ultimate danger. So the parent would do anything to save that child. 
That's why Allah says, Kum al-fusukum ahlikum nara wa kudru al-nasu wa hijara. Allah says, save yourself and your family from the fire of fuel, whose fuel is humans and stone. Allah says, save yourself. Alright? So then when you look at Islam, don't look at Islam as a burden. And that's why Aisha, Allah, she said, that if the Prophet the first thing he did was tell people halal and haram, the Sahaba wouldn't have followed him. He spent 13 years not talking about anything halal and haram. He didn't spend that time. He spent building their connection to Allah, understanding their purpose in life, why they're here. It was all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Understanding what, 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 is, what is the point of what they do. And that's one of the most important things about education. All right? So the idea is, and never, as a teacher, you should, your goal should never be in 45 minutes, like any other subject, to finish a lesson plan. But rather, to teach a lesson. All right? It should never be the point to have memorized all these things. Because the only way you're going to give this kid a trophy is going to be acknowledged in front of everyone is that they memorize a certain surah, but the kid will memorize, forget it the next day. It's not the point. It is that one ayah reaches the heart. Right? That you feel that sense of empowerment through Islam. So then when you realize that Allah, when He tells us not to do certain things, then you realize, you know what? Allah loves me. And He wants me to stay away from these things because He actually wants what's best for us. And no one understands you more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to many things. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, Sister Layla, Sister Layla, should I stop? I don't know, it's 8.30. Or should I keep going with it? Anyone have a question? Yes. Alright, what's up? Anyone anyone actually have a question? Alright. How much time? How much you guys don't want to keep going? Should I stop? I have a question. Yes, sir. I mean, we live in a world where everything is there. 
a lot of people say until you're young, one day I'll tell you, right? Like one day they had a superwork commercial. I remember my eighth grade students came to me the next day. They're like, Brother Hassan, where do babies come from? All right? So that's a whole awkward discussion, all right? And the thing is, when they went to their parents, they said some stuff that made absolutely no sense. So the kids went to their kid in the class and they asked him, and they gave him all the wrong education. All right? So as parents, we have to learn to talk to our kids as adults. We have to treat them like adults at, a, at that level. Right? Don't think our kids are just things we give money to so they can go away. Right? Don't think our kids or even our wives, we just give things, you know, here, here's this gadget, just get away from me. I don't have time for you. Go play this PlayStation, go play Fortnite. Right? Instead of Qiyam night, we have Fortnite. I right? asked because how many hours of Fortnite do you play a day? He's like, I want to play eight hours. He's like, brother, if I play for 12 hours, is my fast still acceptable in Ramadan? If I play Fortnite all day, right, and I sleep all night, all right? I was like, subhanAllah. Even though now, now like, they're coming with something different now because they realize kids, but imagine for parents who don't know, kids actually pay $5 to watch somebody play Fortnite. Like this guy makes so much money, all right? Off kids, I was like, subhanAllah, all right? Anyways, so going back to the example, he told Ali, he talked to him like an adult. He said, look, these idols that you that there, they're, they're, you, know, you have to reject them. That system in Quraysh, you can't do that. You have to accept Allah as your creator. Imagine, he's talking to a 10 year old like an adult. So Ali's like, whoa. So he's like, look, I can't take this decision on my own without my father knowing. So Prophet said, said, okay, because there's no compulsion in religion. He said, look, but, but don't tell anyone else about this. So Ali goes to sleep that night. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the love of Islam in his heart. And the next morning he goes to the Prophet and he asks him, what is it that I need to do to become Muslim? And he tells him the shahada and he becomes a Muslim. Alright? So here we see a very, very important thing. As parents, we have to constantly be educated. Not only our kids. We have to understand the society around us. We have to be able to understand the culture around us. And what our kids go through on a daily basis. Number two, to your question. The word youth, I, a lot of people don't like the word youth, right? The youth, the youth. I remember when I came in Tampa, when I was a young kid, everyone said the youth, the youth, the youth. The youth will take over. And 30 years later, the youth haven't taken over yet, right? That guy who was 40 or years old, who was a board member, is like 80 years old now. Right? It's all the youth, one day will take over. I was like, what are they going to take over? The microphone or what? I mean, what is it that they're taking over? There's not taking over, right? They're still... In, position, in the same position, that nothing has changed. All right. Now, in Islam, the word youth is technically to the age of forty. All right. Also, um, I was attending. I attended opiate crisis meetings, a type of drug addiction, and I attended with other faiths. So they 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 talk about these challenges they have in their churches. Right. I remember last year when I was getting, or two years ago, I was finishing my degree in Sharia and I was starting under the, the masters. So they had all these priests. Or I mean, some uh, men from the, the, the church that were getting their PhDs in, in, their, in their respective fields, and they were saying nobody's coming to the church anymore. No kids are coming. So one of them is like, you know, they start doing these dancing and stuff. He said that's not the right. We can do that, but that's not the, that's not the purpose. So now when it comes to ten-year-old kids, we need to stop. I think the same. They're the youth. Talk to them like adults. All right. Raise the level of thinking. Imagine instead of talking, who's better, LeBron or Jordan? All right. Everyone will talk about it to the end of judgment. We're not going to find the answer until Yom Al-Qiyam. We're probably going to play one-on-one -on -one or something. You never know. All right? Um, but we're never going to, you know, everyone, Stephen A. Smith thinks he's smart, right? He's just start yelling, right? Anyway, that's a different discussion on its own. They all have these things. And they have, you know, kids watch the pre-game show of an NFL game. All right? You have the Dolphins and the Bucks. All these different, they, they consume the minds of these kids, right? And, they, and kids can analyze and know the yards of somebody, how many, you know, people... How many yards somebody ran that game? How many points somebody scored? Right? How many songs somebody came out with? All these things that is useless information. How is this going to help in your life? Not really. Not in any way or form. But it's, it's the, so then we so then we have to realize. All right, instead of worrying about what somebody wore at a wedding, what car somebody driving, what somebody said about you, because not and they'll and they also people say, oh, the world hates me and all this stuff. No, oh, nobody cares about you. Nobody knows you. All right. Not the Instagram story. But anyways. All right. When you when your focus becomes Allah, then we understand that. So some of the challenges kids face, they go to public school, they don't get to pay Jumaah every week, so they're not connected to the masjid. And we can school. Parents expect their kids to be, become scholars in like four hours. 
All right, I'm, I'm a principal of a weekly school, and I, we have around 200 students. And so we have a lot of refugee students. We have a lot of some orphans. We have people, a lot of the public school. I told the parents, weekly school is like a Friday at home. Right? I, there was a 16-year-old kid coming, he, and he didn't want to be there. I told him, what do you want your son to do, right? He's like, you know, teach him Quran and Arabic. I'm like, your son doesn't even can't tell him Quran and Arabic. He doesn't even want to be here. Right? You want me to force it upon him? He'll memorize it. All right? But it won't have any effect on him. I said, I, I talked to the kid, I'm like, what are your hobbies? He's like, I play basketball in the gym, and I play Fortnite. I'm like, do your parents have to force you to do that, or you do it on your own? He said, no, man, I wake up in the morning, and I do it on my own. I said to the father, that's my goal. He said, your kids. They themselves want to get up on their own and memorize. They themselves understand who they are. They understand themselves. So I'm not. I'm not here to just do what the traditional thing is. Just push upon them. All right. You know my kids. They go to Bayan Academy in Tampa. All right. And they memorize all these. You know, just a tabarak, and they're like eight and seven years old. But I'm not really impressed with more of the fact that this this uh, the this sword they memorize more than the character they have and exemplifying and practicing. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about 10-year-old kids and parents, we, are, we as parents, first of all, have to know what are our expectations. Alright? Number two, I did a, I said this in the khutbah that we came up with uh, all the subject matters, everything a child needs to know by the age of 10. So for example, everyone by the age of 10 should be able to pray. They should be disciplined enough to be responsible to wake up 5 o'clock in the morning to pray fajr. Imagine, that's a big responsibility. Right? That you're training your son from the ages of 7, 8, and 9 years old to be able to make that decision, constant decision, to wake up and pray. To be able to pray in school, alright, on their own. So now you're teaching, these, so that's why, you know, when it said the first 7 years, you get to know your kids. The next 7, you teach them. But the next 7, 14 to 21, and that's what most people want to teach their kids, that's too late. That's when you supervise them. They're not young adults at this point. Alright? Those when you that's too, that's the age. So then I highly advise this, and we're talking about education. The elementary phase is so important nowadays. Establishing that foundation. Not just reading and, and, and writing. Alright, because language is a means of communication. But more so is that kids at a young age understand Salah, understand Allah, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just memorizing the names and doing Islam. But understand what, what it means to be a Muslim. What does it mean to follow Islam? Right? Because at a young age, if you establish that, and then they go to the next stage, 11, 12, 13, that's middle school. That's when all the other stuff comes about. Right? And there's other challenges, dating and you know, cursing now, even homosexuality. I had a student one day, he's like, he's like, brother, I'm gay. I was like, whoa. Alright? This is this is true, this is really happening. Alright? And his parents didn't know. Or they did, they wanted to, you know, came out. So I had to actually address that issue. Drugs is a real issue, right? I remember uh, I was sitting with a husband and wife, and he came to me, and they have two kids. And the wife said, The only time I can talk to my husband is when he's high. I'm like, High off of Iman? She's like, No, high on Hashish. I was like, Whoa. All right? So he went to her uncle to confess about his problem. His uncle's like, I do it too. All right? So imagine if parents are having these challenges. What about our kids? So we have to be real with ourselves. We can't be hypocrites. We can't be hypocrites. All right. We can't tell our kids, "Don't do this," and then at night we're spending three hours in a hookah lounge. We can't do that. So it goes back to the point. The kids look at what we do. You know, my daughter; she's two years old, three years old now. When I pray, she doesn't know what really. She just goes up, and jumps on the ground, right? Because she follows what I do, know what I say. She looks at my example. So, so then the way I talk, the way I conduct myself, the way I talk to my wife, the way you, you, you're, you're patient, you don't get angry, you show respect, all these things, as parents we have to be able to understand that the way we use our phone, kids are like mama, or baba, you look at, you, you use your phone more than you, tell me not to use my phone, look at you, right? You tell me not to do this, but all of us are doing it, so we have to understand, are we a challenge in our kids' life, or are we a blessing? Are we making it tougher on them? Are we actually being a good example? We have to really be honest about that. So before we want to push everything on the kids, we ourselves as parents have to like really ask ourselves that question. Alright? And that's why when it comes to building an assignment school, or it's opening assignment schools, we really have to sit down and say this is a necessity. That we bring our kids not just so we can just teach them certain things about reality, invest. You know they say if you invest one million dollars in a masjid, you should invest two million dollars in the community. 
the Prophet ﷺ invested in the, in the Sahaba. So what he did was he would train a young companion and then send them off to a different country to go to Islam. Right? So our kids, when we go to college, we go there. So when we say about challenges, there's many challenges. Right? Life is a challenge in itself. Right? So, so it could be the drugs, the temptations, the, the relationships. All these different things are happening, right? But it goes down to all these things are symptoms. The core thing, all right, is when you realize what is your purpose in life? Why are you here? All right, who are you serving? So then when as a 10-year-old, when, when the 10-year-old realizes and learns that, and you go to middle school and you, you understand that concept, all right, we're empowering our kids through Islam, then they're able to really, when they, by the time they get to high school, and we compiled... Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, there's a chef named Muhammad Qutb, he wrote a book called Qa'ad al-Ma'asim, right? And subhanAllah, a lot of that stuff applies today. We have to understand our times. So for example, 50 years ago in Palestine, you had to know about communism, Shia, right? It was a big thing in, in, in the back then. Now you don't have to really know much about it because it doesn't exist. Nowadays you have to know about feminism, capitalism, secularism, all these different isms that are contradicted to Islam. We have to be able to know what these things are. So also, 10 years ago you had, anyone don't know here, Ahmed Didam? Right? He used to do videos about Christianity. Right now Christianity is under big threat. We have over 1 billion atheists in the world who don't even believe in a God. Right? So now back then it was important for our kids to know about Christianity and 40 years ago about communism. Now they have to know about atheism. They have to know the arguments they're bringing. How they bring it. Right? What, what is the angles they use? How do you put your kids on the defensive? Anytime I give a, a talk at a high school or a college, they never ask you about the, what are the five pillars of Islam? What are the six pillars of Iman? They don't ask those kind of questions. The first question they ask is why do you oppress your woman? Right? The second question they ask is about Sunnah and Shia. Right? The other question they ask is about Palestine. The fourth question they ask is what do you think about homosexuals? Right? They ask these questions. And that's the type of question they ask their kids. They don't ask those basic. So the only thing if they learned in a Sunday school and in a Muslim school is the five pillars. And they go to this world, this class, and they're asking about all these things. They're like, whoa. Right? They don't even know what to say. They don't even know how to answer these questions. They never were told or empowered to answer these questions. Then about the, 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 the other things. That's that have to do with doubt, desires. We have to talk to our kids about drugs. We have to talk, we have to, talk to our kids about, you know, it's okay to feel a certain way about another person. It's okay to be attracted to another person. But don't act upon it, all right? There's ways you handle things. How do you handle that? We have to have that discussion. We have to respect the feelings of our kids. We have to acknowledge that, hey, you know what? You know, you know the Prophet ﷺ gives us a hadith that there, a man came to me and he saw the Prophet ﷺ kissing and being nice to his grandkids, Hassan Hussein. And man said, I have 10 kids and I never kissed them. The Prophet ﷺ is not my fault that Allah has taken the mercy out of your heart. It doesn't make you more of a man, or right? To not hug your kids or say, I love you, right? Or not to, you know, to to acknowledge their feelings, acknowledge. You know, Prophet ﷺ saw a young companion, and we had a young companion, Anas ibn Malik. Anas ibn Malik was one of the grand companions who was always with the Prophet. He had a younger brother who was around four or five years old, and his bird died, right? Imagine your kids, their, their, their toy breaks. What do you say? I want to buy them another toy. All right, well, what's the big deal? Prophet ﷺ is a leader of a whole Muslim country, has so many things to do, takes time out to go to this young boy. What does he ask the young boy? Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala Nuhair. Alright, he says, Ya Aba Umair, what happened to Nuhair? Nuhair was the name of the bird. Now, Imam Tirmidhi explains, why did the Prophet call him the father of Umair? He doesn't have any kids. He's only five years old. He said, was, he gave him a kunya to empower the kid, to make him feel confident as a young boy. Imagine, imagine how you know, a lot of times we look at kids, Ya Allah, kids, get out, Yalla, Yalla. Right, and mother, like when we had the Yalla kids. Right? And Prophet Hassan is like, no, no. Ya Abu Ahmed, he gave him, he empowered the young boy. He said, what happened to your bird? The Prophet Hassan knows what happened to the bird. He was acknowledging his, his, his feelings. Right? He was acknowledging the young boy's feelings. And that young boy, when he grows up, he has a positive association with the Prophet Hassan. Imagine that. And that's why I say when you have people like Sheikh Hassan Sabri and other educators, it's not about the stuff they teach in class. It's about you have role models that your kids imagine are with them for eight hours a day, right? And they're sitting and they're able to ask the questions. They're able to encounter them, be around them. I remember when I was in ninth grade, there was a chef from Britannia that came. His name was Sheikh Al-Tirudan, seven years old. My dad used to take me to him every day after school. I used to spend nights there with him. 
right? He used to teach me, that, that, you know, the, the man he might have and other things in that, in, that, in that regard. And I remember, like, when I, he used to wake me up for fish, he used to like, squeeze my feet really hard. And the only channel he ever watched was the Discovery Channel for some reason. He liked the animals, all right? Because I remember the one way he used to teach you, you have to memorize the poetry, and then, and then he'll teach you after you memorize it. So I remember this being around these characters. I remember the guy who used to hold the Sadaqah box at the masjid. Like all these people were role models. So we have to be role models. So you have to ask yourself, everyone has to ask yourself, am I a positive asset or am I a challenge? Am I something positive in my family's life? Or are my parents like, Alhamdulillah, my husband left. Or are you that kind of person? All right? Or what kind of heba do you bring? What kind of presence do you bring to the house? What kind of presence do you bring to the classroom? What kind of presence do you bring on social media? Ask yourself that question. So when we talk about challenges, yes, there is challenges, but they're all symptoms. We ourselves have to understand that these things are always be there, but we have to be able to understand them, but also be examples in, in, in leadership, inshallah. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? So uh, this is a couple of minutes I want to talk, touch upon the, you know, the ideas of Islam. I know they passed out a survey. So one thing I want to say about... Uh, these surveys and all these things is that hype, we always get hyped up in the beginning about when we start something, right? You want to start a halakha, everyone gets hyped up. You want to start a school, everyone gets hyped up. And then after a couple of weeks, the energy dies down. And that's why I don't say, don't do anything emotional. So what we need to do is, is always start off, like say pre-K through second. Perfect that, even if you have 10 students. Don't look at numbers, all right? And ask yourself, what is it that you want from each, each class to them to achieve by each class? Alright? So then as families and parents, we know expectations and we know what, what is it required from you. By realizing that this is something that has to happen or should have happened yesterday. The community is growing. Alright? So, so it's more not this opening a school and the survey is being passed out right now. But it's really, really understanding how important it is for our kids to understand and because if we don't, all right, if we don't do it, then there'll come a time your great grandkids, well, not even probably most of you, don't even know them. All right, we have to prepare from now. That's why I say start. People say, when should I start raising my kids? I said, the moment you get married, even when you're in high school, because one day your kids will probably go on your social media and see what you did when you were in high school. Now, everything's online. One day your kids will see what you did. All right, so it's very, very important that you the raising of kids. Starts even before you get married. Because how can you get married and you just don't become an adult by overnight? Huh? You just don't become a mature, responsible. This when you get married. People think it's like a magic wand. You say, I do, and that's it. You're responsible. That's not how it works. All right? You know, actually have to really understand what does it mean to be with the other human being? What does it mean to have a conversation? How many of you can actually have a conversation for 20 minutes without talking about sports, about a party, just talking about something that's beneficial? about Islam or a world topic and be able to break it down in 20 minutes without getting an argument, without it having to be awkward, right? Imagine, what, how, what is the last time as a husband I've had an actual discussion besides what's for dinner tonight, all right, or what's going to happen on the weekend, I actually had a discussion about something really substantive, like with substance, that your kid's like, wow, my mom and dad actually talk about something meaningful, right? Like I'm going to actually listen to what they're saying, or is it, hey, I say this, halas. No, that's it. All right? You know, it's like dictatorship. We talk about overseas, but is it the same thing here? So it's really being able to exchange ideas. So when we talk about the school, I think we should, even if we start off with a very, very little number of students, it should start, begin. Because why? If you start today, 20 years from now, you'll be the reason that hundreds of kids started. All right? With 92, we only had 80 students, 50 students. Today the school has 700 students, all right, over 700 students. So the idea is, especially in Florida, subhanAllah, we're blessed in Florida. My sister, she lives in Dallas. They don't get step up for kids. They don't get scholarships for school. Only Florida is one of the few states in the United States that actually even pays and gives scholarships for those who make a less than a certain amount to go to actually Islamic schools and private schools. So not only do you have the government helping to fund this, all right, this is, you know, you have, you have that advantage that we should take advantage of. Because, we, we, to be honest, before they had the scholarships, the Islamic schools only had like 200 students, 300 students. Once the scholarships came, the numbers increased. 
that people are able to actually put their kids in the school. So we have, we have the benefit of scholarships for our kids, you know, so you have the ability to actually get, you know, good books and textbooks and so forth. More important is to invest in good teachers. Somebody who's, you know, somebody you have to find that person. Invest in that person. Invest in good teachers. Teachers are what make a difference. You can have a million dollar building, state of the art classrooms, but if you don't have, you have to have good leader teachers. So as a community, one of the most important things is finding those teachers that you're gonna trust with your kids for eight hours a day. All right, eight hours a day. So then we have to really invest in that. All right, because imagine you're busy, you have two jobs, you have this and you have that. Teachers have such an influence on our kids. All right, so that is one thing inshallah I advise you to do. I know I'll stop here. I mean, I can go on for however long you want me to. Uh, unless somebody has any questions, comments, or feedback, I'll give you guys uh, 30 seconds to, uh, or a minute to you know, raise your hand. Anyone want to raise your hand and ask a question? Nobody, nothing from the sister side? So that being said, Azakallah khair for your uh, time, inshallah. This is, a, this is a nice gathering. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering. That tonight, inshallah, is a night where history is made, and inshallah, is the starting point of actually establishing an institution of education for our kids for long term. That people like Sister Layla and others, that we should empower them and really support them and get this thing on. Even if you have five students the first year, it doesn't matter. But it's something you start and build upon. And for those who, you know, the older brothers and sisters of high school, middle school, and college here, realize when you do something good, when you come to the mansion, other kids think it's cool. When you post something online that's, you know, that's, that's actually a, a good reminder, other kids will talk to you. Realize how much effect you have on your siblings. Realize how much effect you have on others. By you simply coming to the mansion Friday night, you probably got three other kids to come. You made Islam the cool thing to do. So realize you have more of an influence than even the imam or sometimes the teachers or the adults as high school and college kids. You have such an influence. Don't underestimate. Use your influence for good. Alright? That being said, Zakum Lahir, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.